Sorry about that. Um, Pizza showed up. Did some damage. So we're going to resume. Um, Tiffany, uh, do you have some more Im- information that so you'd like to disclose? So I just want to finish up this whole 90 degree thing. Okay. Just so that it's very clear that the, that the kind of wave we were talking about, an electromagnetic wave. Right. You have the electric wave on the two-dimensional plane. Then you've got the, the magnetic wave coming oscillating in it, or I mean going in and out perpendicular yeah. to the two dimensional plane. Right. And so that this sort of a wave is called a transverse wave because the E field, which is the electrical field, and the B field, which is the magnetic field, are perpendicular to the propagation direction because it always propagates to the right. And um, an electromagnetic wave propagates at the speed of light, which is C. And C equals 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It's fast. So So there's millions and millions and millions and billions of people out there without education, with an understanding of the world or, or an education level that would not allow them to understand that easily yet. With the most feverish religious conviction, they believe the Earth is a globe. Certainly, that they don't think that because of these exquisitely articulated details that you shared with us. They don't think that because of these, because they probably haven't been exposed to it. Um, what, are there any reasons, just as a regular person, that just absolutely convince you? In the way that millions of other pe- billions of other people on the planet are absolutely convinced that the Earth is a globe, without having to to rely on that. Because I mean, I mean, I confess I don't totally understand those uh, okay, equations. Well, I wanted or... to talk about Maxwell's equations, but okay, on a fundamental level, no, I have no reason really to perceive the Earth as a globe if I had no education. Because, but. It's kind of silly because we live in the modern world, so we don't do anything practical. We don't have to do anything for ourselves. So we can just turn on GPS or use some machinery to get to our destinations. And we don't do anything practical where we would be charting out navigational points. Or Well, when you go shopping at a mall, and at some basic fundamental level, you're assessing where you're at and the shops you want to go to and you're navigating how to get there. And you're, you're certainly not consciously using any mathematics, at least most people aren't. They're just using an, an experiential, natural, observer sort of way to, 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 to do these simple things. So, I mean, and they, they typically don't let us down. We, we know how to navigate through a crowd to get to, to another place. So at what point... Like in 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 with regard to like space or time or I mean, at what point do those faculties no longer become um, reliable guides and tools? At what point do we need to abandon those and then start getting into really difficult physics and 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 abstract math mathematical philosophies and equations and all that stuff? Well, do you think? Any, I mean, there's no definitive answer to that question. Endeavors, but if you're just interested, like we never, that's why it's hard for me to explain why the earth is a globe because it really doesn't come into my day to day living. And unlike you, <clears throat> one of the, the, the main reasons why I do believe in the flat earth is because I still rely on those faculties, at least to some degree. Um, in regards to this, I think that the, the, it, it doesn't transition out of practical experience and then into abstract you rely thinking. On what faculties? Like sight, scent, sound, mm-hmm. you know, assessment of space and how to navigate from one point to another. You know, right. the and simple fundamental. That's good enough. Right. I was just asking you at what point then um, do they no longer, are they no longer useful in that in order to actually believe in the globular heliocentric model um, do depart from that and enter the, the school of affirmation 
which is abstract mathematics and abstract physics and philosophical physics and theoretical mathematics and theoretical physics, all that stuff. Well, I guess uh, people that want to possibly make scientific advancements would think that was important, well, but that's... Well, I agree with I that. raised six children myself, so I well, yeah, we, wasn't we out there. raised the same six, yeah. yeah. So I wasn't out there trying to... Um, Prove anything. So, okay. Well, having said that, um, you know, uh, why? Why would somebody lie about the? Why would somebody lie about the the Earth's shape? Whatever. That's a really great question. And I've been thinking about that movie. You made me watch Dog Tooth, which after you've seen it, you know, I totally recommend it to anybody who loves film. And I would totally recommend it to anybody who actually is interested in this topic because it's one of the few, it's obviously not Hollywood. I, what was it, Greek? Or it was Eastern European? Um, who's the, the director? I can't remember. Oh, darn, because you showed me a couple of his movies. Well, anyway, it's, uh, after I got done watching this very difficult movie, I realized that it's just a metaphor of Western political culture and power uh, w when you begin to watch the movie it's um you you see a family an affluent family in their 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 very very nice home and uh it's a mom and a dad and there's three kids but the kids are all like 18 19 20 sort of like really actually adults but they still behave as children and when you see the family interact at like dinner and stuff you you realize that they say oh, will you hand me the telephone and one of them will pick up the salt shaker and give it you know they've renamed everything in this movie and that's very confusing and there's all all kinds of other elements but what that made me think in retrospect of is is uh power and how do you control people and if you lie to people about every aspect and you lie uh, of the reality, and you lie to them about the nature of their reality, and you reframe it in in a way that's the opposite of what it is. You have created a control parameter, and then once you've established this this control paradigm, really, then you can work and navigate all the details to your advantage in regards to controlling the behavior of the people that you're ruling over or trying to protect or whatever. And I thought that was really interesting. And um, I don't want to keep talking about that, but that's something that I, I think that, or at least I like to keep in mind as I go through all this. It seems uh, a lot of times that what we're taught is the, the very opposite of what actually is. And maybe even just that cognitive dissonance is part of the I, I'm, I'm sure it's not just a singular strategy i'm sure it's a it's a multifaceted elaborate um strategy that's been based on all the psychological advancements that have made in the 20th century albeit due to cruel inhumane practices and experiments in actual human beings by unscrupulous professors and doctors but now i digress so what do you have anything to say about that or if you don't do you have something else to say well, I don't really have anything to say about that except for just that that can be the danger of labeling or arguing within paradigms or labels is that there's a lot of baggage that comes with that. So that's... Okay. All I would say about that. And then yesterday, I, I know you mentioned Cologne. Oh, yeah. So I wanted to just talk about that a little bit. You mean so like his theory on charged particles? The behavior of charged particles? Because that's what I was trying to get to when yeah. I brought his name up. Okay. Yeah. So, um, cool. what, I, what, what I was talking to you about before with my little chart for mm -hmm. the electromagnetic wave. Uh, I love we, that chart. That was really well done, by the way. We under You can thank an Indian school professor for that. Cause she, well, thank uh, you for bringing it to my attention because I never would have found that on my own. Diagramming it for me. But... We understand this due to Maxwell's equations, which are four neat equations. And without his equations, it may have taken a year to understand something that we can quickly explain with his equations. And up until Maxwell, we had independent qualities. We had electricity and then we had magnetism. Electricity was governed by things like Coulomb's law. Mm -hmm. 
And then magnetism was governed by things called Ampere's Law. But then we got Faraday's Law, which started to tie these two together. But it wasn't until Maxwell came along and combined all those things into one quantity that we ended up knowing light itself is made up of electromagnetic waves. So folks know a lot about light, or photonic about electricity particles. or magnetism, but they didn't know light itself was an electromagnetic wave. So we've actually come a long way in our understanding since Colum, because I know you put a lot of stock into a lot. Well, no, no, my only, my only, the reason I brought Colum up was because <laughs> as Newton, you know, he was an alchemist, he was a physicist, he's a mathematician, he's all kinds of stuff, right? So as he was struggling in his his lovely chateau being commissioned during the seven years he was there meant and and um charged with the task of coming up with a mathematical um uh, proof of the existence of the theory of gravity that as he was making observations and stuff uh he was a genius obviously maybe he stumbled across what Cologne stumbled across like a hundred years later, 150 years later or whatever. And maybe when he saw how the charged particles behave, that that gave him a eureka moment to just translate that microscopic observation into a macroscopic observation. And that because of the truth and the microscopic, um, uh, the microscopic observations of the behavior of charged particles that maybe he just translated that into gravity and thought, yes, because this works awesomely. And so he's not really accredited with coming up with a formula for charged particles because, I mean, this is just total, um, um, what do you call that when you guessing about something? Oh, conjecture. It's just mm -hmm. total conjecture on my part. Well, but that's the reason truth. I brought him up. I mean, if is you that, look is that, up, there's true facts because, you could bring to the table. Well, there's some professors out there that teach physics <clears throat> that will say, oh, you know, it's a very similar. It's a very similar equation between Coulomb and Newton. It's just uh, one is a macro, macroscopic level and one is a microscopic level. And that just, that seemed, when I heard um, a couple people, well, what about professors Coulomb say that. Maxwell? Well, I don't know. I mean, I only brought up Cologne and his theory of charged particles so that I could tell you that maybe that's where Newton got his ideas. Maybe he discovered them first, but since he was interested in another goal, he didn't celebrate that discovery. He just used it as a springboard to I, total conjecture once again. Anyway. So, and then I wanted to point out um, what something that Sean Carroll said again about the probability called the wave function. Uh, he said, when you describe something like a particle, you don't talk about its position or velocity like I was trying to do yesterday. Uh, those are things we can observe about it, but it's not what it is. It is more rightly described as a cloud of probability called the wave function. Uh, is that something that that maybe I can understand by attributing those same qualities to how we... Uh, understand the model of an atom where it's not actually like a nucleus with you don't see like the rings of the protons or electrons going around it that it's actually a probability field and that kind of yeah okay yeah and the copenhagen interpretation you know from the double slit experiment double slit, yes uh says that the wave function evolves according to an equation called the Schro schrodinger equation but then when you look at it schrodinger equation uh, you know, make an observation, the wave function suddenly collapses, but we shouldn't really be looking at it like at it like that is what they're trying to say. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of smell what you're starting to cook. Because it's more a uh, broader range of probability. And what happens... We're just identifying two limited potentialities, and we're not taking into consideration all of the potentialities. Yeah, and from the ever from the Everett model, um, when you look at it that way, it doesn't have this linear equation. Uh, and it's not that, oh, if you observe it, then the wave, uh, it collapses into, or the particle switches to a wave or anything like that. What's happening, what Hugh Everett says, is that you become entangled in the wave function, which makes a lot more sense. What do you mean you, just through the act of observing? Yes. Well, if even if that's true... 
there's still a strange relationship between the simple act of observation affecting the manifestation that matter chooses to to show itself in you know what i mean sure hmm that's that's some crazy stuff crazy stuff quantum physics yep so um that's all i really wanted to say in rebuttal to last time um even I though in conversations there's not really rebuttals like there are in debates but yeah i, I get what you mean because this is a conversation despite your notes all right now notes aside let me return again to the question that i asked you before like just mm -hmm. as a regular person people if you ask a little kid is the world a globe or is it flat? And the, a child, a school child, would tell you it's a globe, obviously. But they don't know any of this. So what reasons might they have to be absolutely convinced well, what that the Earth is a globe? What <clears throat> reason do you have to believe that any town exists besides the one you live in? Or that if a tree falls in the forest, if you hear the sound, or if that makes a sound, or if you don't hear it, does it make sound? I mean... Uh, well... To the first part of the question, just experience, <clears throat> which is why like zetetic, um, a, a, a zetetic a method is a really critical one because what when you, people put the zetetic title on something, all they're doing is just giving uh, a new name to the scientific method, which is based on experience. Where you can personally, experientially do an experiment and come up with a predicted result. Mm -hmm. But as far as uh, what was the second part of that, you. Uh, what did you just ask me? If a tree drops, oh yeah, that's a good one. One there to hear it. Does it make? Sense? Well, from my limited understanding of the relationship between the observer and the manifestation of reality, that uh, am I safe to assume that if there is no observer, then there is no manifestation? Mm -hmm. So, if you say mm -hmm, and you actually agree, then. Um, you're safe to if assume no one, you can if assume no anything one, and you're safe. You, I mean, you logically, to, logically, logically, fell, logically. So, so if no one is there to experience it, then yeah. no, it doesn't fall. It doesn't fall? No, just like, oh, uh, was it? it just, whose cat? Whose cat is it? Schrodinger's cat? Yeah, yeah, his cat. It's not dead to, it's observed being dead. Once uh -huh. you observe, that the observation yeah, is a critical part in, in reality literally. manifesting itself is all yeah. I'm saying. What? I just think you take all this entirely too literally. And the other thing I was going to say was, sure, it doesn't matter to your reality, but it does re matter to the reality of people that are actually out there making advances in science and the medical field. And Okay. All right. You want to go there? All right. We're actually about to wind it up, but I'm going to say, okay, so let's take a look at what the, the history of advances has given us. It up, doesn't up, matter. Up until 150. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Up until 150 years ago, there was a Christian dogmatic culture that per permeated Western civilization. And we got to that point. As soon as evolution came around and, and we began to prove with science or whatever that the earth is a globe and stuff, we've had 150, 160 years of having the whole God equation, the whole biblical equation being pushed out of what drives our civilization forward. And what have we had? We've had the most bloodiest, most horrible, violent, terrible century the, the world has ever known, at least as far as modern or as far as history is concerned. We we've we've poisoned the planet. We've we've had World War One, two, and we've had World War Three going on for thirty years plus. Spread out the uh, the the average lifespan of of you know this is subjective. Um, statistic but from what i've heard is that the average lifespan of a grown human being on the planet for the 20th century has been like 37 years just like it was for somebody living on a plantation or a farm Good job you made it way past yeah right <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway it's it's all right i, I think i've said enough before okay. i and that is definitely a subjective rambling. opinion it is because, it is it's totally um, subjective like all opinions because there's probably a lot of people who watched, you know, had six or seven or eight or 10 or 12 kids and watched seven of them die or five of them die, you know, be, due to disease and hygiene. and True. But if they would have lived. Um, 
but they didn't. Oh, oh, no, no, no. What I'm not saying is there's a difference between the experiences of suffering and the hardships of, of humankind. What I'm saying is that because of technology, the way that we could expand that to more people with more devastation and more impact and more power just, as it has that's that's what i'm putting emphasis I know, on but I i'm just, not saying i'd rather live on with an outhouse and no penicillin i was gonna say i do find it ironic that you say this in the position of privilege that you currently exist oh in. man all right that's very ironic all right cool cool there's something to think okay, about but, you're right okay. no fair point next time fair could we possibly point. Let's just talk Fair about point. Cologne a little bit. Maybe you could well, actually, if you rely on electromagnetics, maybe you can bring something to the table. Well, I would like to, To I mean, we'll see what happens. But like I've already said, that since we're not technicians. Okay, well, next time I'm going to come and talk about gravity and Cologne. And I'm probably going to ask you once again, like what regular reasons do most regular people have to be so passionately convinced that the earth is a globe. I don't need convincing. Honest to God. Oh, I didn't I say you care. did. I'm talking about most people. Because if I go out there and I talk to people and I say, hey, the earth's flat, of course, you know, you're insane. And honest to God, and I people don't get mad. care. Okay. All right. All right. I, I think that you do. No, I, I honestly don't. I mean, at least to whether it's such an extent that you want to have a conversation with me on YouTube about it. So. I just like to do it because I like to educate myself. So. I thought, well, if I have to study some of these topics, like maybe I'll keep it, retain it in my well, long-term memory. I confess it. I like doing these because they're fun. Okay. We'll be back with six sometime.